Hi, everyone. My name is Natalie Hall. I'm a senior consultant here at Education Elements. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about stakeholder engagement, particularly in the plan and align process. So quickly, I'm going to walk you through a tool that we use at Education Elements to determine who we might engage during this point, what tactics we might use to engage with them, and then really centering in on the why for this part of the process too. I'm also, after this, going to pass it over to Kim, who's going to talk to you a little bit more deeply, specifically about equitable stakeholders core engagement, common pitfalls that befall us in this part of the process, and some really great tactics and self-reflection strategies you might want to incorporate as you incorporate equity more so at the forefront of your strategic planning process. So we define stakeholder at education elements as a person with an interest or a concern in this process. And of course, since that's such a broad definition, that means that we have so many different stakeholders who fall into that group. And that also means that each one of these stakeholders has different needs. And so as we think about particularly equitable stakeholder engagement, it's really important that we are super intentional and are meeting our stakeholders where they are. So at Education Elements, we like to use what we call the stakeholder engagement matrix, this two by two, which helps us better differentiate um, who we might be talking to in our community and really making this a human-centered experience. The four different categories that we like to look at in this matrix is high influence, low interest, high influence, high interest, low influence, low interest, and low influence, high interest. When we say influence, all we mean is that the level of authority that the stakeholder group might have in decision making about the plan. And when we say interest, we mean um, the level of impact that this plan may have on their daily lives or in their professional lives. So when we look, excuse me, at the top left corner, particularly at our high influence, low interest folks, great ways to engage them are to really think about what are the quick hitting, high leverage points that they need to make sure that they're hearing on a regular basis. What are the big themes that they need to hear? What are the big takeaways that they need to move decisions forward? And keeping communication at that level. And then when we look at our high influence, high interest folks, these are really the people who we want to involve every step of the way. They're deeply impacted and their support will really make sure that aspects of the plan will move forward. So incorporating people in this group as a thought partner, considering the expertise that they bring to the table and really involving them in the design of the plan is major. Third, we have our low influence, high interest folks. This is a group that might be saying, I'm not very interested or rather I am very interested and please don't forget about me. This is another group that often um, in these kind of processes and big undertakings like a strategic plan uh, might be available to really lean in at specific points and give expertise about specific topics or requests. So think about in your district who might fall into this category. And last but certainly not least, we have our low influence, low interest folks. This is a group that is very important. All groups in the quadrant are. And something that this group might be thinking are, I'm not very interested and don't need to be involved, but don't forget about me. Especially for this group, as they might be a group that is often um, left out of conversations involving the strategic planning process, um, it's super important to make sure that we are engaging them intentionally and specifically, um, and how you might utilize other engagement groups to spread word to this particular quadrant about what's happening with the plan. Last thing I'll leave you with before I pass it over to Kim a little bit more is a couple tools. As you go into this document, it'll help you to articulate your why, identify your stakeholders, plot your stakeholders on the matrix that we just went through, and then explore tactics aligned to wherever your stakeholders land. Another thing that I'll mention is we have a connect guide. Kim will go into that a little bit more deeply. And the role of this guide is to help you think even more deeply about equitable stakeholder engagement. So I wish you the best of luck. I encourage you to use the matrix in your early conversations and continuously throughout your planning process. And I'm here to support in any way you need. Thanks, everyone. Hi, I'm Kimberly Stewart and I'm a design principal with Education Elements and I want to take a moment to talk about equitable engagement. When districts engage stakeholders, often they find that the voices that they hear from most frequently don't necessarily represent the community at large. Historically, marginalized populations in particular tend to be underrepresented in stakeholder outreach. This trend is surprisingly common when a district does not intentionally plan for equitable engagement. Now, I want to zero in on my use of the phrase intentionally plan for a moment. You may feel like all community members are invited to share their voice, 
but I challenge you to consider what you are actively doing to create spaces that begin to remove some of the barriers that may create disconnects in your community. So consider how you might intentionally engage stakeholders in a way that both invites and amplifies underrepresented voices. To learn more about how you might do that and how you might intentionally plan for equitable engagement, check out our Connect and Include guides. Now I want to leave you with a question to consider. What is one shift that you might make in your approach to stakeholder engagement to ensure that your strategic plan is both intentionally inclusive and responsive to your community's needs? Thanks so much for watching. For more content from Education Elements, be sure to follow us on Twitter and check out our website. Hi, I'm Baltazar from Education Elements. I'm a former teacher and coach who spent the last couple years working with districts to redesign what teaching and learning looks like. From my experience as a teacher, as a coach, as a leader, I've had to think about the best ways in which to engage multiple stakeholders when we are reimagining what education looks like for our kids. So today I'm gonna to offer a look at the ways in which you can structure your different teams as you approach the strategic planning process. How many people should we include? How should we include them? How often should we meet? Let's talk about these big questions and some other considerations to keep in mind when it comes to the strategic planning process. One of my favorite things to do is go trekking. The last chance I got to do it was at the beginning of last year when I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. When I think about the strategic planning process, it reminds me a lot about some of the components of that journey. Firstly, the goal. It was a group of people moving from point A to point B, stopping intermittently along the way to pause, reset, and say, okay, do we have what we need? Are we doing this the right way? What adjustments do we have to make? The second thing that it made me think of is the roles that I saw play out. We had some novice climbers who had to get a little bit more guidance. We had some guides who helped forecast the path ahead, others who watched for mountain sickness from our team, and we had porters who specialized in helping make sure that carrying capacity was managed to ensure everyone's highest chance of success. The last thing is the reward, what I took away from that journey. It wasn't just that we were able to summit Mount Kilimanjaro, it was also the bonds and the connections I made with the entire team that helped me get there. When I think about the strategic planning process, all of those components ring true the way you get from point A to point B, the team and the specific roles people play on that team, and the value you get not just out of what you achieve, but also the process you go through together as a team. A lot of teams start the strategic planning process by casting as wide a net as possible. We wanna make sure we have as many people represented when we think about deciding the future of our district. 
And while that's a great start, we've also learned that it's important to take into account the interest and the influence of those different stakeholders that are being engaged while maintaining a point of view about how many people are on these teams that we're building. Failure to do so can lead to delayed progress of teams moving too slowly, incomplete representation with voices being left out, or progress being made in the wrong direction. Taking a little extra time at the beginning to figure out how you'll engage with those different members of your district and community can set you up for success, not just in the product of your strategic plan, but also in the ever valuable process of it. At Education Elements, we think of the teams in the strategic planning process as layers of a feedback loop, one that generates ideas, presents proposals, and ultimately catalyzes change. We recognize that many people are invested in strategic plans, but oftentimes not everyone can be a part of the nimble decision-making body that the process requires. By outlining your teams in this way, we ensure as many voices as possible are included. We also get the chance to socialize our ideas early and often throughout the process. While we've named these teams, feel free to adapt them as you and your district see fit. The project team runs logistics and is ultimately responsible for the execution and the publication of the plan. They play a core role on the larger steering team. The steering team guides the process and incorporates stakeholder feedback. This team should be representative of background, tenure, and role, and should include your organizational leader like your superintendent. It's important to keep this team small enough to be nimble, but it's challenging, which is why we also have planning teams. The planning team includes stakeholders who are really engaged in the plan, but whose department or role may already be represented on the steering team. This is a larger team and plays a role in executing on the plan. Finally, we have our advisors. The advisory team offers subject matter expertise and support as time and interest will allow. Depending on what your district circumstances are, including your size, these teams can be customized to better fit your needs. But what's important is to make sure that you are engaging your stakeholders in teams that really purposefully include them. Kilimanjaro was one of the hardest treks I've ever done, and I know we were successful because of the specific roles and specific teams that we formed. Guides helped us traverse challenging paths, porters shouldered additional weight, and trekkers climbed within their limits. By focusing on our specific roles, we were able to optimize the experience and find group success. I think of trekking our way through the strategic planning process quite similarly. By having the right people on the right teams, we ensure that we are set up to envision the future that our districts deserve. Not only that, but by working within these teams, stakeholders are set up to lead key initiatives and to strengthen the fiber of the way that we work together. Which strategic planning teams fit best with the structure of your school district?
Thanks so much for watching. As a quick recap, today we talked about the different teams involved in the strategic planning process. Remember, the way in which you engage your stakeholders is as important as the plan that you end the process with. Hi, I'm Andrea with Education Elements. I've been a teacher and coach, and in my role at Education Elements, I have the opportunity to work with leaders across the country as they inspire change to support their students. Today, I'm going to be talking about visioning and the role that it plays in helping you achieve the goals that you set out in strategic planning and even surpass them. We'll talk about how a strong vision captures the essence of your community. Second, we'll talk about how visioning can help you set a direction and galvanize your community. And third, we'll talk about how the process of visioning can help inspire and motivate your team. At Education Elements, we believe that visioning is setting a clear perspective or point of view that helps guide an organization in making difficult or unclear decisions. Often, when we're working in strategic plans, we wanna answer those big questions, the questions that impact lots of different people, which is why having a clear vision is so important for guiding those decisions. Engaging and developing a strong visioning practice can help you and your organization as you're thinking about making choices with often imperfect options. Let's dig into these terms. It's important to understand what they mean in order for you to determine whether you need it or not. So your mission is why you do what you do. Your vision is where you wanna go. And your values are what you believe. Now, your mission and vision tend to be more general. Your values or your beliefs tend to be a lot more specific. All of those things need to be decided based on the personality of your organization or the culture that you hold. You wanna make sure that if you're going to take a stance on a vision or a mission, that you know why it's there and what, how it serves you. Second, visioning helps you set direction and galvanize your community. There are two ways in which you can galvanize your community around your vision. The first is when you're creating it. So ensuring that you have feedback from stakeholders as you develop your vision can make them involved in the process and help them see their voice in the final product. The second is by engaging people in the mission when it's already developed. You might do that through hiring people who are really aligned to your mission and vision, and it might help you keep consistent expectations for those who are still there or who have been there for a long time. Finally, the process of visioning itself can inspire and motivate your team. When you engage in developing your strategic direction, you'll wanna get feedback from your varying stakeholders. Some things you're going to wanna know are, what makes us unique and different? Why do people come here? Why do people stay? All of these different answers are going to help you determine what your unique twist is as an organization. What makes you different? Finally, is the practical part. It's time to put pen to paper and start developing a vision or mission or whatever you choose to call it. We suggest using type protocols when developing your vision. This allows that your voices will be, that many voices will be heard and represented in the final product. We also think it's important to share how you plan to use the feedback. It's impossible to include every word that everybody feels strongly about. So when you go about visioning, it's important to communicate what feedback you're looking for and how you plan to develop that statement or different statements. This is also a great time to consider whether you want to bring an outside facilitator to help you make those choices. It's often easier to be a participant in these types of conversations when you already have a pretty strong opinion about your own organization. And finally, building a strong timeline for how you plan to develop your strategic plan is going to be important in how you prioritize your visioning process. By setting clear expectations with your stakeholders, you can help them understand the different inputs that go into the decision-making process and it helps you build trust and motivation and momentum for when the final product is rolled out. So we've talked about a lot today. First, we talked about how a strong vision captures the essence of your organization. Secondly, we talked about how visioning can help you set direction and galvanize your community. Finally, we talked about how the process of visioning can help you build trust and momentum within your teams. I have a few questions for you. If you've engaged in visioning before, what's worked? What hasn't? Finally, what tone do you want visioning to set as you begin your strategic planning process?
Thank you so much for watching. For more content from Education Elements, be sure to subscribe to our blog, our YouTube channel, our newsletter, and follow us on Twitter. Thanks so much. Thank you.